We're studying uh, what the Bible says about the Bible. And uh, last Wednesday night, we were talking about uh, why there are two testaments, why the Bible is divided, uh, but it's not divided right down the middle necessarily. I mean, we looked at the middle chapter uh, last Wednesday night, and it, that was neat. But the Bible actually is sort of lopsided in its division. There are more books in the Old Testament than there are in the New Testament. <clears throat> the New Testament doesn't have as many words in it as the Old Testament does. The Old Testament tells a lot of stories. And all, in each one of those stories is some sort of mirror or shadow or type of what's in the New Testament and what takes place at Calvary, what takes place at the end of the world. That's why there's so many stories there. You have, I mean, Genesis and Exodus and Numbers, parts of Numbers and Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. They all tell stories. They're giving you a history of, of a people and different things that they did, both right and wrong. And all of those are sort of in relation to what comes at the end of the Old Testament, 400 years after the last word was written of the Old Testament, that was in the book of, of Malachi, 400 years, God was silent. God never said a word. He never called any prophets. He never spoke to any of them that we know of. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say he didn't speak to any, but certainly none of them were told by God to write these things down. So whatever God would have said to any of the prophets during that time, is either already recorded for us in the scripture, or God didn't count it worthy enough. So then comes along Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, you can turn there if you want, but Hebrews chapter 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake unto us in times past by his servants the prophets hath now in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So after the days of the prophets of the Old Testament, 400 years later, here comes God's Son, Jesus Christ. That story is given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. They, are, they look alike. Syn, S-Y-N, is like a synonym. It's similar. And optic means you, they look alike. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I, I talked about the... Uh, teaching that Jesus did at the Mount of Olives concerning the rapture and concerning end times events yesterday. And I compared Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. They say things pretty much similar, but there are differences in them. And instead of you looking at that saying, well, Luke got it wrong. Luke didn't write it down the way the other two did. Luke must have been wrong. You look at it and say, Luke is providing a piece of information that is added to what the other two have said. And that's what happens in any courtroom, or that's what happens at an accident scene. Uh, the trooper won't ask just one witness to the accident. He'll ask four or five, and, he, and from four or five, he gets four or five different vantage points, and he, then he begins to understand what happened, and that's what you have in the four Gospels. John's Gospel, however, is different than the other three. It's completely written in a different way. You can, and there's a lot of love in John's gospel. In fact, the word love is actually found more times in the book of John than it is in the other three gospels combined. And John was the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loveth. Okay? So that's what you get out of John. You get, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get the facts, the historical accurate record of Jesus Christ and his birth, his life, his death, and resurrection. But John gives you the emotion of it. John gives you the feeling of it. He gives you that connection that all of us have in our emotions with God and with Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes then to bring the second covenant, the new covenant. And that is... I will forgive their sins and I will put my uh, word in their inward parts and so on. Um, turn to Romans 8. We left off in, in Matthew 25. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1. He describes sort of the difference between the old and new covenants. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And it could be said that the law deals primarily with the flesh, the body. And the weaknesses, the, the law is good, but the law doesn't make anybody obey the law. Just ask the House Judiciary Committee <laughs> whether they follow the law or not, okay? So the law is there and the law is good. The law doesn't necessarily make anybody obey the law. People will break, people break laws every day. They do it because they want to. And so that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, do these things and God will give you everlasting life. Nobody's done them except one man, Jesus Christ, we see that clearly in those four Gospels. So, when we follow Christ, we're not walking after the way of the flesh. We're walking after the way of the Spirit. For the Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So, two laws. And one makes you free from the other. One then... So... The Old Testament had requirements. Somebody had to meet those requirements. A contract needs to be fulfilled. Right? If you sign a lease agreement and you sign it for a year, how long you got to be there? A year. And if you're not there a year, you're not fulfilling the terms of of the agreement that was the contract and Jesus is the only one who fulfilled all of the requirements of the law he, he fulfilled every one of them so he gets whatever God promised to whoever could keep those requirements and Jesus did it but Jesus is not stingy he shares it we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ in what he receives as the inheritance. For the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for what the law could not do. What the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Which means that we're leaving behind day by day. And I know how difficult this is. My life is no different than anybody else's. And I am walking day by day, slowly but surely, away from the sins of yesterday. Walking away from them as I'm following after the Spirit. Ephesians 2, verse 2 tells us that at one time we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. At one time we followed the devil. There's a couple times we ran ahead of him to get to our sin. Amen. Okay? But now we don't go in that direction anymore. We are slowly but surely, day by day, God is working in us and working us away from those sins of our flesh and those sins of our past. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, Old Testament, but after the Spirit, New Testament. Turn to... Um, well, let's see here. I really want to get to... Yeah, okay. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. And if you know anything about the Jewish religion, the Jews have what they call a Bible, but it's not like our Bible. It simply contains the Old Testament and the books of the Old Testament. They read it. I was at an airport one time and there was a Jewish rabbi who was getting on the same plane as I was. And I just kind of sat across from him and I watched him. And he pulled his Torah book out and I saw him reading the Old Testament in Hebrew. 
my heart just melted for this man. I loved him. I wanted, I, and I prayed for him. God's opened that man's eyes. The Messiah that he thinks has not come has come. Open his eyes so that he can see. All right. And so, but right now, and, and, I, and I couldn't help but think this, as he's reading that Old Testament, the Bible's telling, the New Testament is telling us that there is a veil over his mind. That God is deliberately hiding the identity of the Messiah to the Jews for a time. There is coming a time when that veil is going to, which veil is done away in Christ. When that veil is going to be lifted. When Christ died on the cross and there was an earthquake, what happened in the temple? The veil was rent. It was torn in twain. That which veil was taken away in Christ. And to me, it's always interesting because if you study the Old Testament and look at, look at the history of that temple that, that, where the veil was torn, as that veil is being torn, and now you have everybody who has the ability to look inside the most holy place of the temple of God, they see nothing. There's no Ark of the Covenant there, Brother George. It somehow, we know the Ark of the Covenant was in the days of Josiah, the king. But something happened to the Ark, the table of showbread, the candlesticks. They disappeared. We, to this day, don't know where they are. But certainly, they weren't in the temple. And as that veil was rent, people saw that what they were doing every year for their atonement was no longer possible because there was no Ark of the Covenant. Meaning that Christ had already fulfilled the purpose of the law. There is now no need for the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. Because Christ has taken His blood to the heavenly Ark of the Covenant. It's there. For, and it's going to be there forever. Amen. So that's, that's the difference. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 9. Very quickly, Hebrews 9, because I want to get to the next point about the Apocrypha. Hebrews 9, 15, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. Just as Moses was the mediator between God and the Israelites, Christ is the mediator between us and God. When we pray... We pray, and this is sort of by habit and tradition, but it's biblical. We must always pray in the name and through the mediator, Jesus Christ. You cannot, we cannot approach the throne of God except by the mediator of Jesus Christ. God is holy and we're not. And God will not be in the presence of our, of our sins. So that's why Christ then is the go-between. He's the days man, Job said. Is there a days man between us? Which is not like an ombudsman or a shop steward or however you want to look at it. There is somebody who is being a mediator between the boss and you and that's Jesus Christ. Whereas you were worthy, Josiah, to get fired. I'm just, I don't know about anything about you. You did something stupid and you could have been fired. And the boss said, well, I'm going to fire him. I have to fire him according to guidelines. But you have a shop steward who said, yeah, but it really wasn't his fault. Or I'll take the blame for it. And that's what Christ did. It was laid on him so it wouldn't be laid on us. Okay? For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament... They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then in verse 19, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So he's telling you, if the Old Testament was dedicated with blood, because Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the book, on the Ark of the Covenant, and on all the people. And it said, this is your atonement. But he had to do it every year. He had to repeat the process every year. So that's why they have Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year. And then they have the Day of Atonement. Right? Shortly after that, I can't remember how long, but shortly after that, they have the, the Day of Atonement. That day then has been, and the demands of God has been satisfied. There is now, therefore, no more need for the Jews to keep killing animals 
for the sacrifice because Christ became the ultimate sacrifice. So as the first testament was sanctified by blood, so the second testament sanctified by better blood, everlasting blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Second uh, Corinthians, let me read these very quickly. Who hath also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Matthew 26, 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hebrews 7, 22, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. What is a surety? Huh? Down payment. A surety is you are going to buy the car, you're interested in the car, and that salesman knows you walk up that lot without putting money down, you ain't coming back. So he's going to do everything he can to get money out of your pocket right then and right now. Okay? And, I mean, that's just a, a way of doing business. But Christ then became the surety for us to give us assurance that, yes, we still are saved. Amen? I like these words. These are words that we, these are concepts that we use every single day in our lives. Legal terms that cannot be altered. So if somebody comes along, and I've been studying this for the last few days, how these new Bibles are altering the text of all the Bibles. That's like changing the words in a contract. And if somebody that you have a contract with is changing the words of the contract, why are they doing that? Why would they do that? Because it benefits them. Guarantee you it benefits them. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 is the promise. The old covenant had a promise of the new covenant. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their father. Very important to remember. Very important to remember. Because those who promote the, that we have to go back to the Hebrew roots of everything say the New Testament is not the New Testament. It is the renewed testament. It is the old covenant made new again. Keep the law. And that's how you're going to be saved and stay saved. Okay? Take care, Ron. We love you, buddy. Have a good night. Thank you. Pray for me on my trip, all right? All right, buddy. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. God said, I didn't break it. They broke it. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. It's not just on tables of stone in an ark somewhere. God said, I'm going to put it in their hearts. Write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me. Hey, do you know Jesus? Why, of course I know Jesus. Well, Amen. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That's a promise, by the way. That's God. That's the new covenant. And if you want to know in simple terms what the new covenant is all about, God forgives every one of your sins. Amen. All right, now. How come... And I left my, I was going through that Catholic Bible. No, it's on my desk over here because I was scanning it. How come the Catholics have more books in their Bible than us Protestants? How come they have a group of books called the Apocrypha? A question that I'm asked often, and what you see up on the screen on the right is an actual photograph of a 1611 printing of the King James Bible and they printed it with the Apocrypha in it. 
If you buy a reprint of the 1611 Bible, it'll have the Apocrypha in it. Um, and what's interesting is, is that throughout all of the Bible, through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, the heading at the top of the pages of the 1611 printed Bible gives you that what's written across the top is the name of the book, the individual book that you're reading, whether it's Job or Psalms or Isaiah or Genesis or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But when it gets to the Apocrypha, they don't put across the top 1st, 2nd Maccabees, 1st, you know, whatever, Tobit. Um, they clearly write Apocrypha across the top of each page. In other words, they're separating it out in a, using printing methods, they're separating out the Apocrypha from the rest of the Bible. The word Apocrypha itself literally means hidden away from. Now, I don't, yeah, it's here. I'm going to show you something about, and this is one of the reasons why I think the Catholic Church likes the Apocrypha. I know that, in part, their doctrine of purgatory stems from one of the readings in the Apocrypha. I, I don't know which one, and I haven't studied it out yet. But the concept of purgatory is rooted from what I remember hearing, and I may have misheard, but it's rooted in the Apocrypha somewhere. It's found somewhere in there. Okay, so why don't we have the Apocrypha in our Bibles? It refers to books of dubious authorship. The Catholic Bible has a bunch of extra chapters to the book of Daniel. Bunch of them, I didn't know that. But they, are, they even add chapters to Daniel. And most scholars agree, Daniel didn't write that. There ain't no way he wrote that. So it refers to books, number one, of dubious, which means doubtful authorship, and not counted as genuine. Even though the original 1611 publication of the Authorized Bible contained these books, they were clearly stamped apocrypha on each page. Some clerics in the Church of England referred to them, but the Puritans never did. So if you remember your British history, King Henry VIII was a Roman Catholic until he kept chopping off the heads of all of his wives. And when he wanted to remarry, the Pope wouldn't let him. So he said, fine, we don't have a Pope in England anymore. And he created his own church called the Church of England. And so some of the doctrines, some of the practices of the Catholic Church kind of spilled over into the Church of England. And King James was a peacemaker. He was a peacemaker king. He wanted peace in his kingdom, which is why in 1604 at Hampton Court, he gathered these clerics and these bishops and all of these leaders, and he said, I want to translate the Bible and you guys are going to do it, and I'm going to use Church of England scholars, yay, and Puritan scholars, boo, because they didn't like each other. The Church of England scholars, they, they felt very favorable toward the king and the divine rights of kings, whereas the Puritans said, we don't want no stinking king telling us what to do, okay? So King James said, you guys are going to sit next to each other in groups. You're going to translate this thing. And it's not going to lean toward the Anglican church doctrine. And it's not going to lean toward the a Puritan church doctrine. It's going to follow the Greek and Hebrew and other translations. In other words, I want a clean one. Not one where you put in all these notes and not one where you translate it because you wanted to say this certain thing, which the Geneva Bible did. Did you know the Geneva Bible, it was a Puritan Bible, but the Geneva Bible actually added something that we're wrestling with. You know, Ephesians 6 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. And then the Geneva Bible inserts against earthly rulers. Inserted it. And it's not in the Greek text. They inserted it because they didn't like kings. 
It's probably because kings had them all killed. Queen Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary, was the queen before King James of England, and she hated those Protestant Puritans. She had them slaughtered. So they didn't like the, the kings, the queens of England, and the kings and queens of England didn't like the Puritans. But King James said, you're going to sit together, and you're going to work on this thing, and you're going to do it right. Okay? So as a compromise... The, the first printing of the 1611 King James Bible had the Apocrypha in it. The Puritans, they didn't touch it. Church of England would use it in some of their church services and so on and part of some of their teaching. It is also noted that there are no apocryphal quotations in the New Testament. In other words, Jesus and all the apostles and the writers of the New Testament, they quote heavily from the Old Testament. They don't quote one time from any book in the Apocrypha. That tells you something. It's not that they didn't know those books were around. They knew they weren't scripture. Now, I'm going to show you something I found years ago in the book of 2 Esdras, which is not in your Bible, it's in the Apocrypha. Now, the Catholic Church is, in my estimation, a mystery religion. And, and I just read this the other day, the official Catholic position on, let's say, uh, Hyun Mi is a Roman Catholic, we're just pretending, but she's a Roman Catholic, and she goes to the priest and says, oh, I've been reading my Bible, and it says that you're supposed to be married. Well, the priest is going to tell you, Hyun Mi, Hyun Mi, God has given it into the hands of the Holy Mother Church, the divine exclusive right to interpreting what the scriptures mean, not you. In other words, we don't mind you reading the Bible, but you believe what we tell you to believe. Okay? That's what they do. So, it's, a, it's, it's the idea that the clergy are the special ones selected by God who have a right to know things about God that nobody else has a right to know. I mean, my goodness. For about 12 to 1300 years, they did every Catholic Mass in Latin so that nobody would know what the Bible really said. They did that on purpose, to hide scriptures from the people. Okay? So keep that in mind now. In 2 Ezra 14, 38, this is a story about Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet hears the voice of the Most High. This is allegedly now. Here's the voice of the Most High. The Most High tells him, go out and find five men who are scribes because I'm going to just pour these words down to you. And I want you to recite them to these scribes and they're going to write them out. So we pick it up in verse 38. And on the next day, and again, this is not the Bible. This is the Apocrypha. And on the next day, a voice called me saying, Ezra, open your mouth. I'm sorry, Ezra, not Jeremiah. Ezra, open your mouth and drink what I give you to drink. So I opened my mouth and a full cup was offered to me. And it was full of something like water, but its color was like fire. This is weird. So I took it and drank, and when I had drunk it, my heart poured forth understanding and wisdom increased in my breast, for my spirit retained its memory and my mouth was open and was no longer closed. Now, my first guess is we know that Mystery Babylon holds a cup in her hand, and she makes everybody drunk with it. They, in their drunkenness, they think they're being illuminated. Okay? But they're not. They're being stupefied. So, and to me, that's what, that's what I'm getting out of this. Anyway, so watch this now. Moreover, the Most High gave understanding to the five men, and by turns, they wrote what was dictated using characters that they did not know. Da, da, da. In other words, they were writing 
in a secret language that they had no idea what it was they were writing. Characters that they did not, so if nobody knows the characters, who then can read it? Right? And that sounds like Joe Smith. The story of Joseph Smith is that the angel Moron I gave him these, or showed him where these golden plates were, and they were in a re uh, reformed hieroglyphics, is what he called it. And he had to put on these special glasses he called the Urim and Thummim. And through that, he could see and translate what the plates said. And then, he and then he had somebody transcribe that for him. He had somebody writing it out for him while he was reading it. That's what it sounds like to me. Now, so then, so during the 40 days, 94 books were written. See, you didn't know this story, did you? They didn't teach me that in Sunday school. And when the 40 days were ended, the Most High spoke to me saying, make public the 24 books that you wrote first and let the worthy and the unworthy read them. But keep the 70 that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. In other words, the unworthy people, George, are not allowed to read them. That's a snake. There's a serpent in that. You didn't know that was in there, did you? Never read the, I never read the Apocrypha. And somebody gave me a Bible. It's a, I can't remember what translation it is. But I picked it up one day, and it's been years ago. I don't know where I got it from. But I opened it up to the Apocrypha, and I'm going, I'm going to read the Apocrypha. And I opened up to that page. It's like God said, Mike, I want to show you something. Okay? So in other words, all the puny peons down low don't have a right to know what those 70 books said. Only the elite will be given the knowledge of what's inside those books. Other than that, you'll never know what's in there because you're not worthy enough. Who in here is worthy even to read this Bible? No, not one. None of us are. Okay, but aren't you glad? You see, that go to me, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Satan said, for God doth know. In other words, what? God didn't tell you that when you ate that fruit, your eyes would be open and you would be as gods? God didn't tell you that? It doesn't surprise me. Because God has a secret mystery religion, and I'm the one that's going to share it with all mankind. Mm-hmm. Okay? So... That's one reason why we don't read the Apocrypha in our Sunday school classes and in our church services. Amen? Amen. All right, I won't, I won't go past that. But that's right there. Number one, what's in here in the Apocrypha, and we have no idea who wrote it. It's like the book of Enoch. We don't know who wrote it, but one thing we know for sure, Enoch didn't. Enoch didn't. How would, how would it have survived the flood? Even if he did, how did it survive the flood? So we don't have a record in the scriptures of Moses bringing in the scrolls of Enoch into the ark. We don't have a record of that anywhere. Okay. So, I don't believe the book of Enoch belongs in the Bible, and I don't believe the Apocrypha belongs in the Bible. Then you have, you have stuff like this, where he's drinking this mystery fluid, and all of a sudden his eyes are opened. Okay? And they're writing in secret symbols that nobody knows what, the, you know, what they mean. Nobody can read it. But then the idea that Jesus never one time quoted anything out of the Apocrypha. Never. Neither did Paul, neither did James, neither did John, neither did Mark. None of the New Testament writers quoted anything from the Apocrypha. But they quoted heavily from the Old Testament. So that's the bridge. That's the idea that we have these two Testaments. Can two walk together except they be agreed? 
Just like your two legs or two people in a marriage, can two walk together except they be agreed? And so as the, as the legs keep going, so does the Old and the New Testament. Just keep rolling along. Amen? Okay, and this is how God is going to lead us to that heavenly promised land is through the pillars of fire of the Old and the New Testament combined together. It's here a little and there a little. It's precept upon precept, line upon line. It is, as Paul said, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Spiritual things in the Old Testament, spiritual things in the New Testament. Paul didn't say, and spiritual things from the Apocrypha. He did not say that. So, that's why we don't read it. Beyond what I just showed you, I haven't spent five more minutes reading anything from the Apocrypha. I don't care what's in it. I have no interest in it whatsoever other than what God showed me that one day. And I didn't pick up on those funny letters until today when I was typing this into the PowerPoint. I'm going, what? They wrote it in funny letters? I never knew that. Okay, so I didn't know it until today. But it's books that we don't need. 66, we've got it perfect. Amen?